You're a nice Jewish boy. What are you, what, <laughs> what, what, what are you doing with a big ship? I don't know. I don't know. I just, uh, there's no real answer for it. I just, I guess I just like the challenge. The 1920s and 30s were a golden age for ocean liner travel. European shipping companies ruled the transatlantic market with prestigious record-breaking ships, many of which became household names. In 1921, the failed United States Mail Steamship Company was consolidated to form the United States Lines. The new company was co-founded by Kermit Roosevelt, awesome name-haver and son of President Theodore Roosevelt. Their passenger fleet mainly consisted of German vessels seized after World War I. One of these ships was the Vaterland, renamed the SS Leviathan. If you fudge the numbers, she was the largest ship in the world. Her conversions to an American liner were overseen by William Francis Gibbs. The project was the first major contract awarded to his newly formed firm, Gibbs Brothers Incorporated, later to be renamed Gibbs & Cox. He oversaw the project with his characteristic obsessive attention to detail. But the Leviathan ultimately proved unsuccessful with passengers. This was for one clear reason. United States prohibition laws outlawed the sale of alcohol on U.S. registered vessels, while the nearly identical Cunard-operated Berengaria and White Star Line-operated Majestic garnered popular reputations as luxurious party ships, the Leviathan languished as a super fun dry ship. Gibbs, however, was proving more successful, designing a series of white hull liners for the Pacific-based Matson Lines and four smaller vessels for the Grace Line. Gibbs' work was popular and innovative, and he yearned for the opportunity to finally design his own superliner. But the struggling United States lines was continuing to accumulate debt and went through a series of ownership changes throughout the late 20s and 30s. Despite these issues, the line was heavily subsidized by the United States government, and the passage of the Merchant Marine Act of 1936 provided the funding necessary to build new passenger liners. The Leviathan was widely considered a financial disaster, and conveniently ignoring the whole dry ship snafu, most felt that superliners were best left to the Europeans. Instead, it was decided that the new ship would be a medium-sized cabin liner. While her size and her speed wouldn't turn any heads, Gibbs was determined to design a thoroughly modern ship that would test out the innovative designs he hoped to one day incorporate into a superliner of his own. <laughs> The new ship was the first to be built by the newly formed United States Maritime Commission. She was to be named SS America to commemorate what was seen as the rebirth of the U.S. Merchant Marine Fleet. Gibbs and Cox won the contract for the new liner to be built by the Newport News Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company in Virginia. She was laid down on August 22, 1938. In 1935, Gibbs and an apprentice snuck aboard the Normandy in New York after her maiden voyage. Gibbs took meticulous notes and incorporated many of the innovations he observed on the French liner in his new ship. Her hull featured a flared bow with a slight bulb, a concave forward section, and an overhanging spoon stern. Gibbs was obsessed with fire safety long before Normandy met her fiery end. He was fascinated by the challenge since childhood and the recent Moro Castle disaster was fresh on his mind. He integrated several fireproofing features and used a fibrous particle board called Maronite to partition the ship's interiors. We fondly know the material today as asbestos. She was one of very few liners at the time to have interiors designed by women. Cox retained Dorothy Markwald and Anne Urquhart to design the ship's 23 public rooms. 
They steered away from the Art Deco styles popular at the time and opted for what Mark Wald described as a simple, comfortable American style. They incorporated light-toned woods and fabrics with metal accents and ornamentation. The designs were bright and inviting and proved deeply popular with passengers. As originally built, the ship came in at 26,454 tons. She was 723 feet long with a beam of 93 feet. She had 11 decks and could carry 1,202 passengers and 643 crew. She was powered by two double reduction geared steam turbines that produced 20,000 horsepower and drove twin screw propellers that achieved a service speed of 22.5 knots. The liner was launched on August 31, 1939 and christened by Eleanor Roosevelt. The Nazis would invade Poland the next day, swiftly making the Americas intended European routes too dangerous. Her maiden voyage took place on August 10, 1940, beginning an awkward first year of service, mainly keeping in the relatively safe waters of the Caribbean. The United States was officially neutral, and to further protect the new ship, her name and two giant American flags were painted on both sides of her hull to keep her from being mistaken for a foreign liner. With war all but inevitable, she was requisitioned by the United States Navy on June 1, 1941 to be used as a troop ship. She was renamed the USS West Point and underwent conversions at the Norfolk shipyards in Virginia. She was modified to carry 7,678 passengers and her first voyage transported German and Italian consulate workers back to Europe. She would prove to be a vital asset for the United States Navy, transporting over 350,000 troops, more than any other Navy troop ship in World War II. She traveled all over the world and earned several distinctions for her service. Finally, on February 22, 1946, she was released from her troop carrying service and began the process of returning to her intended career as a luxury passenger liner. On November 10, 1946, after a multi-million dollar restoration process, the SS America sailed into New York Harbor, finally ready to begin her long-delayed transatlantic career. She proved popular passengers who loved her bright, beautifully decorated interiors and graceful design. She was widely considered the queen of the American merchant marine. But in 1952, she was joined by her much larger and faster running mate, the SS United States. Despite those advantages, the SS America remained deeply popular, some even preferring her over the larger liner. She continued sailing her transatlantic route through the early 1960s, but after 1955, she began sailing to tropical ports in Bermuda and the Caribbean. But as time went on, her popularity began to wane, as passengers increasingly opted to travel by air. At the end of 1963, she was laid up, bringing her time with the United States lines to an end. During her 18 years with the company, she sailed over 2.8 million nautical miles and carried over 500,000 passengers safely and reliably. On November 16, 1964, she was sold to the Greek-owned Chandris Lines and renamed SS Australis. The growing company was in the process of buying older ships to provide affordable travel on the lucrative Europe to Australia immigration route. She underwent an extensive refit to increase her passenger capacity to 2,258. An outdoor pool and air conditioning was added to make her more suitable for hot climates and she was painted white with blue funnels, sporting the line's logo, the Greek letter Chi. Her maiden voyage with Chandris left Southampton on August 21, 1965. Like her United States Lines career, these voyages were largely uneventful, aside from a minor galley fire in 1970 and a minor collision with the Australian aircraft carrier HMAS Melbourne in 1974. Over 12 years, she completed 62 global voyages and transported over 300,000 people to their new lives. But by 1977, she was the last liner providing regular service from Southampton to Australia and New Zealand. The liner was rapidly aging, resulting in higher maintenance costs. Paired with rising fuel costs and a drop in passenger demand due to newly introduced long-range flights, the Chandris Lines decided to bring her service to an end. Her final voyage left on November 18, 1977. She was laid up a month later. And this is where her career shifted from steady, uneventful service to kind of a mess. Why should people take a cruise to nowhere, to Nova Scotia, on, on the American? It's a complete entertainment facility. As you know, we have many, many facilities in the ship. There's just one contained entertainment palace. Uh, uh, 
cruising is very popular. There's, uh, there's uh, more ships cruising today than ever before. You're a nice Jewish boy. What are you, what, <laughs> what, what, what are you doing with a big ship? I don't know. I don't know. I just, uh, there's no real answer for it. I, just, I guess I just like the challenge. Uh, it's, just, uh, it's just fascinating. I, I love it. And uh, I'm going to make it the best ship in the world. Usually when a cruise line buys an older ship, they invest time and money into a refit to bring her up to date. But not Venture Lines, who bought the SS America from Chandris in 1978. The American company, owned by a group of travel agents, purchased the liner with plans to offer cruises from New York City to... nowhere. Really. The idea was to offer a luxurious break from sweltering New York City summers, which in theory isn't a terrible idea. 1970s New York was apparently a bit of a hellhole. Her inexperienced owners invested $2 million into repairs on the ship, but the nearly 40-year-old liner's condition required significantly more work to bring her to an acceptable state. But rather than delay her first cruise, the group heavily marketed the classic liner and changed her name back to America to capitalize on her history. They promised a glamorous two-day cruise to nowhere at a rock-bottom cost of $99. Her first cruise was scheduled for June 30th, 1978, and it was... well, it was something. As passengers boarded, they were horrified by the deplorable state of the ship. Here we go. Faulty plumbing left water stains on walls all over the ship and flooded many cabins. Beds lacked sheets and some didn't even have mattresses. Some of the ship's toilets didn't work. There were piles of soiled linens laying in heaps all over the hallways and public spaces. The pool was open, but full of bags of garbage. The company also managed to screw up their tickets, leaving many passengers without assigned cabins. They were left to aimlessly traverse the halls of the ship, guided only by the hordes of cockroaches and rats. As the ship passed the Statue of Liberty, hundreds massed around the purser's office and began chanting, we want to get off. And conditions only deteriorated from there, with some passengers getting into fistfights with crew, demanding they be allowed off the disgusting ship that one woman later described as a floating garbage can. They were eventually forced to return to the pier, offloading 960 passengers. The ship attempted a second sailing later that day, but those passengers also took one look around and said, um, hell no. She was forced to drop anchor near Coney Island, where her shell doors were opened and people desperately clambered their way down rope ladders to waiting tugboats that ferried the 200 traumatized passengers to the only slightly better Staten Island. After the nightmare cruise made headlines, Venture Cruises bravely admitted that they had, quote, goofed. They gave it another shot, this time offering a five-day cruise to Nova Scotia, a slight improvement over nowhere. This one actually made it out of New York, but when she encountered heavy seas, a water main fractured and backed up her toilets. So, a ship cruise before the ship cruise. Passengers finally escaped when the ship limped its way into Halifax. Venture Cruises admitted that once again they had goofed, but this time they promised that on her next cruise, quote, you will see a ship full of happy people aboard a great lady named the SS America, about to have the time of their lives aboard a tip-top vessel. They did not. By now, authorities had stepped in to prevent future hell cruises and would later charge the line with deceptive advertising and business practices. After an inspection by U.S. Public Health Services, the ship was given a 6 out of 100. With mounting fines and canceled bookings, Venture fell into bankruptcy without ever operating a single successful voyage. The SS America was put up for auction and sold for one-fifth of what Venture had paid for it. Recognizing a sweet deal, the SS America was actually purchased once again by the Chandris line. They performed necessary repairs and were forced to remove her forward funnel, which had been corroded to the point where it couldn't be saved. The quick fix left the ship with a slightly awkward profile. She was renamed the SS Italis and offered cruises in the eastern Mediterranean. But her second Chandris career was a short one. Though they restored her to an acceptable condition, the liner had suffered years of neglect and was in dire need of a major investment if she was going to stay competitive in the now booming cruise industry. But Chandris wasn't ready to make the necessary investment and the ship was sold in 1980. For the next decade and a half, the SS America's fate was left uncertain as she was bought and sold a number of times for a number of different purposes. Plans were even considered to turn her into a prison ship at one point. For a brief period, she was renamed the Noga, and then the Alfredos, 
although they didn't finish adding the new name to her hull. So technically, only her port bow was the Alfredos. Her stern and starboard bow remained the Noga. In the late 1980s, she was sold for scrap, but when her buyer defaulted on their payment, the ship's fate was once again left in limbo. Finally, in October 1992, a buyer stepped in and purchased the liner with the intention of turning her into a floating hotel in Thailand. An analysis of her hull showed that structurally she was in surprisingly good condition, and she was renamed the American Star. Her propellers were removed, and preparations were made to transport the liner to Thailand. After a failed attempt a few days earlier, she left Greece under tow by a Ukrainian tug on December 31st, 1993. The challenging trip was scheduled to last 100 days. But not long into the voyage, they encountered a violent storm that snapped her tow cables, sending the unpowered liner adrift. Crews boarded and attempted to attach an emergency line, but this proved unsuccessful, and the crews had to be rescued by helicopter. The American Star was abandoned, left to drift until she finally hit a sandbar off the west coast of Fuerteventura in the Canary Islands on January 18, 1994. The stricken liner was immediately pounded by the unrelenting surf. Any hope of salvage was dashed when just 48 hours after beaching, the battered liner broke in two just after her aft funnel. She was declared a total loss on July 6, 1994. Her wreck would remain a bizarre photo opportunity for locals and tourists. Her stern portion collapsed in 1996, leaving her towering front half looming for almost a decade, until it too finally collapsed into the surf in November of 2005. It was a sad and undignified end to what was once considered America's flagship. The SS America had a long and varied career, transporting hundreds of thousands all over the world. She was in service for nearly half a century and was beloved by passengers. She also clearly served as an early blueprint for the SS United States. But if we didn't have the breathtaking images of waves crashing against her decrepit hull, would anyone still give her any attention? Maybe her iconic end, in some small way, saved her from the cruel indifference of time. Thank you.